Okay, hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webinar, Why You Should Focus on eSports, Experts Share Their Advice. My name is Kevin Hogan. I am the editor-at-large for eSchool News, and I am happy you're joining us today for what I know will be a very insightful and important conversation. This event is brought to you by Epson. Epson's award-winning education solutions are designed to empower teachers to rise above digital distractions and deliver interactive, creative, and laser-focused learning environments with super flexible, low-maintenance, and budget-conscious technology. Specifically designed with educators in mind, Epson Laser Displays deliver big, bright, immersive learning experiences to captivate, engage, and inspire every student in the room without compromising whiteboard space. Before we go to our conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some features of the platform that we're using for this webinar. This event is being recorded so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with the PDF of the slides. Also, there is a chat function that you can launch by clicking on chat. Feel free to use this feature to contact someone from the eSchool News team if you're having a technical question. With these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started. Remy, over to you. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Remy and I'm a product manager at Epson and I'm excited to be participating in this webinar. I'm new to esports topic myself, so I'm expecting to learn a lot from our uh, hosts today or from our guests today. Esports has exploded a lot in the last few years. Uh, there's a lot of uh, scholarship money up for grabs. High schools see sports as a chance to motivate students academically and provide opportunities. And college sports teams can also make a difference in attracting prospect, prospective students. Uh, so with many middle and high schools trying to figure out how to get involved from uh, starting an esports club or a team and helping their students prepare to go to college to uh, focus on a degree in the esports industry, we hope that today you will find this webinar insightful and interesting. I'm here today with Nick Swain, uh, founder of JMU X Labs at James Madison University. He's responsible for the space used by JMU's esports team and is involved in planning how the university will prepare college students for jobs in esports. Also, Fresno State varsity esports coach Ryan Serrano and Fresno State's esports athlete Jonathan Moran. I hope I said that right. Uh, they are going to share some great insight about esports and provide some universal tips that can help our stakeholders and you um, to for your school to enter this arena. Uh, no pun intended. With that, thank you, Nick, Ryan, and Jonathan for being here today with us. Uh, we're going to queue up a, a poll question, um, and I'll start the question for the team here. Let's start with uh, all of you, starting with Nick. Can you introduce yourself and share a little bit about your role in esports? Sure, I'm. Uh, I, I run this this program called the X Lab. Uh, you'll hear maybe more about it, and you're certainly welcome to look us up online. Um, but but it's really the intersection of a lot of different um, disciplines, and one of the areas that uh, we started exploring uh, a couple years ago and really actively this past year was esports as uh, a growing industry that intersects across all disciplines on, on a college campus doesn't necessarily fit in one. Um, and so we're, we're the likely uh, host of that. Um, we've started uh, growing the program and um, yeah, we have a varsity, uh, varsity the, the, the starting of a varsity program here at JMU. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Ryan? Um, I am the head coach for the Fresno State's Overwatch team. Um, I've also been with the program since its very infant stages. So um, I've helped Fresno State kind of build a lot of the stuff that's associated with esports, um, including the um, the online events. Um, I'm sorry, the um, the Twitch side of things, so streaming platforms, um, social media, as well as um, in-person events as well that we hold um, in the city itself. So thanks, Ryan. How about you, Jonathan? Yeah, um, my name is Jonathan. I, I'm actually a student at Fresno State, but I'm also one of the players for the League of Legends team. Um, I've been on this team for two out of the three years now, um, that one third year being COVID, one of the COVID years. And yeah, it's been an interesting ride. Well, thank you. 
So I'll start actually with questions for Ryan and Jonathan, um, delving a little bit deeper into your East Coast program at Fresno State. Um, can you tell me where it's located? Uh, maybe Ryan, how do you select your teams? Um, how is your arena outfitted? And how did you decide to get involved? What's the origin story? So um, our, our eSports arena is located in the basement of the uh, Student Union Center. Uh, so it'll be um, where kind of like our bowling alley is. Uh, so there's, it's basically a large conference room with uh, soundproof glass. Um, there are 13 computers, uh, six on one side of the room, six on the other side. And then there is one uh, stationary computer that's in the corner that's held for the coaches. Um, that's how we're able to use um, and share uh, our screens with um, our bright light um, uh, projector. Um, and pretty much just, it's pretty easy access to get into there. Um, in terms of how I started with the program, uh, there was an advertisement on um, on our Instagram page um, when it first started up asking for coaching positions and they were filling out. I applied, um, our previous uh, head coach, uh, Joshua, was already at the position, but I knew that I needed to be a part of this. So I reached out to him, asked him if he was in, interested in having an assistant. Um, he wasn't at first, but after I showed up and interviewed with him and showed him um, my knowledge of the game and just like my overall passion for um, Overwatch and esports in general, um, he decided to take me under his wing. And I was with him for about two and a half years. And then just this um, past month, I did get um, promoted to the new head coach as Joshua did leave. And uh, we've had plenty of success here, at least on the Overwatch side of things, uh, winning at least three championships in the last uh, three years. Uh, how do you go about selecting your teams um, within, within that criteria? Um, everybody's different. Um, so speaking on uh, the Overwatch side of things, um, usually students will just, we have pretty much open tryouts. So even if you have, you know, hardly any skill in the game itself, you know, it never hurts to try out. Um, we look at, you know, your communication skills, your ability to play the game itself, availability, and just overall, like, um, passion and wanting to be there. Um, making those cuts to roughly about 13, 14 players um, when applicable. And we'll have two different sets of teams that participate. Thanks, Ryan. How about you, Jonathan? Were you always a gamer? Or can you tell me a little bit about your day to day? Yeah, so um, I started playing video games when I was around three because it's my dad didn't want to pay a babysitter, so he knew I'd stay put. <laughs> um, with the League of Legends team, I was one of the original like board members to get esports onto campus. Um, I helped promote that like this is what students need. Um, for the president of the school and stuff. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting. Um, we could do something similar to Overwatch where we have tryouts and then, you know, they cut it down once and then cut it down to the final team. And um, it's a little different than Overwatch, but it kind of, you know, it's, just think of it like a regular basketball team tryouts. You know, it's you do skirmishes against each other and stuff like that. And then, you know, whoever looks the best gets to keep going, so... That's about you, how it goes. Were you playing in high school or and and that's how you got in or you sort of were a casual player and then you got into college and yeah, so during high school I was just playing with my friends for fun and then towards around my sophomore year I started deciding that this is something I kind of want to take farther and see how far I can get and yeah, it's been it's been a good ride so far with that. Yeah, I'll have more questions about that and kind of like your magic, magic wand or what you wish you had as a high school student. Um, Nick, I know you have a, an esports program, but you're also involved in talks about new careers in esports um, and ways universities can support that. Uh, can you tell me, can you tell us what you're doing at JMU and what high schools and middle schools need to do to prepare students related to what Jonathan was saying as a casual player? Um, and last but not least, I know you have that beautiful chart that shows all the different careers within esports, and I'm hoping you can share with us. Right. Okay. Well, here's. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen here. So I think um, 
one of the first things that a college or university can do to support esports is provide a space for it. And so this is uh, this is actually one of the first days that we were up and running with esports and and had the uh, the screens up on the wall um, projecting what the students were doing in their in their games. And so um, so having a space like this that that students know is their space is is a really important aspect of that. Um, but then w one of the things that that really I, I'm not necessarily a gamer. I I, I look at it more as a um, really is a responsibility of, of universities to prepare students for the future. And so um, I, I look at things like this, which is um, eSports job growth. And I, I'm not the author of this. Um, it, 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 according to the chart, it came from a company called Hitmaker. But it, looking at the, the job growth in, um, in eSports, in eSports programs across the country, not just in players, but in um, all of the wraparound um, um, academic programs that are that that uh, are associated with esports, and and that's this is the 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 chart that you were talking about, where um, the traditional esports athletes are kind of in that gray area in the middle, where they're, they're the players and they're the ones that everyone focuses on, but from an academic perspective, these wraparound um, skills. Uh, are, are really where I think our, our larger role might be, um, you know, broadcast journalism. There's a there's a difference in how um, broadcast journalism works for um, news, for sports, and for esports. And and if we're not preparing our students for each of those different skills um, or roles, then I I don't think we're doing our job. And so um, my focus has been on. Um, preparing the teams and making sure we have competitive teams because that's how you get street credibility and and then from there growing out into these other academic areas that you see here um, and so so that's where I think um, getting what what high schools and middle schools can do is start to get their students to understand that um, there you know there are multiple roles besides just the esports players and um, even uh, w one of the things that we look at is um, the the like theater and dance. If if you look at a video game, it, a lot of it is like a theater where you're trying to tell a story through images. And so those folks can be part of the esports industry um, in telling stories through the images that are on the esports um, games. So so there's really room for everybody here, and and I think that's really the the message that they should take away. Thanks. Are there particular um, in, in sort of that branch branch trees? Are there particular careers that are more low hanging fruit and or more immediate? And you're seeing an uptick in in. So, so the low hanging fruit are the faculty that are the most interested, <laughs> and that's um, and and I. So we're we're starting um, now with pulling together a faculty team, and we're going to look at event management. Um, sports and rec management, broadcast journalism, and IT, as, and bring those those four disciplines together and create um, an intro to esports program that will then branch out into other areas for more advanced programming. Um, okay, I'll have more questions on your setup, but I'm going to move to Jonathan real quick here since he, he was talking about he was a casual player in high school. Um, so, uh, Jonathan, when we talk about students in middle or high school, uh, is there anything you wish you had known then or advice or things that you could have done differently to get engaged more um, heavily uh, off the get-go? Um, yeah, I think as a, if, I wish when I was in high school, you know, I had my group of friends and we all sat around and talked. I wish we kind of made it into a club, more so a club, make it more official with the school because that's, you know, you make it into a club and then the school season, that's how you start. That's how you get the ball rolling. Um, that's what my biggest advice would be is, is don't be afraid to make it more official. Um, that would have helped us all out a lot looking back at it, so. Um, so as someone who didn't really grow up with a little bit, I, you know, just playing out in the street and in the backyard, are there particular challenges with regards to being in front of the computer 
and playing games all day that you guys try to sort of counter or offset with encouraging people to get into gaming and also like have a physical balance. Yeah, one of the biggest challenges I had in the past three years was keeping my wrists and like hands, uh, pre preventing them from developing carpal tunnel. Um, you know, we, we talked to a bunch of like, uh, sports people, I don't know, like exercise and they helped us like with stretches and like small wrist movements to prevent it from getting tight. Um, another thing is, is staring in front of a computer screen for that, like eight, 12 hours a day can be very draining. So one thing that we pride ourselves on is we really want to make sure that after we play, the first thing we do is, is like walk around, stretch and go outside either you know get coffee or you know just just de de-stress from that situation because staring at a screen can depress you real quick thank you um okay question for nick and ryan uh, many people uh, may think that creating a physical space for an esport program uh, or an arena it could be too technically challenging or too involved um but you know just looking at some of the photos that you shared uh, generously with me, it seems like it can also be fairly simple. Uh, can you describe like the physical location of your arenas and the setup and the technologies that you use? I think um, any particular advice of do's or don'ts in terms of infrastructure for schools that may have an IT uh, personnel that may be trying to help them get that going? Maybe, um, Ryan, I'll start with you on that one. Um, so one of the bigger things that's um, rather, it's unique, or maybe not necessarily unique, but it's a uh, very, very important to um, our room and frankly, gamers in general, is uh, we have our own separate um, internet that we use that's separate from the rest of campus. Um, it's our own. There's a box basically in the corner, and that's how we are able to run all of our games without having to worry about any lag or anything like that, um, or any DDoSing or anything that can technically like interfere with our games when we're playing um, in our games and stuff like that online. Um, so having something that's separate from that would be um, probably one of the easier things, perhaps, um, and more encouraging. In terms of space, I mean, just it depends on, I guess, what. Um, what kind of game you're getting into. So we offer three different or three games currently that are part of our varsity program. We have Overwatch, League of Legends, and Rocket League. And all of those games have different number of minimum players. Overwatch needs six, League of Legends needs five, Rocket League only needs three. Um, so depending on how big your teams are and how many players and you want to keep on, uh, you can have anywhere between, like I said, like we have 12 computers. So we have up to two teams for Overwatch. League will also have enough for um, two for five v five, and then Rocket League actually can use up to four teams if they wanted to because we have twelve computers, so that's four teams of three. Um, <clears throat> so it just it just kind of depends on what you want to um, what esport or what game you want to get into. Um, same thing applies for the um, the machines themselves. Um, Obviously, like some of the games can be like very graphically heavy if you choose to to make it so. Uh, I believe uh, both League of Legends and Rocket League have <clears throat> fairly low uh, settings that they need just to have it run bare minimum. Um, Overwatch is probably just a little bit more, but even on those settings, it's still pretty basic. Um, so keeping those things in mind, you can probably still build a rig, especially in this day and age when graphics cards are going for a couple grand each. Um, for a really low tier card, um, you can still get something going even with like the more simpler uh, products just to get it going. Um, so figure out which game you want to run. Um, try to find what those specs are, how many computers you would need associated with your game. So like I said, depending on what game you have, it can be six, five or three and a secure internet connection that's separated from your school. So that way there's no uh, lag or anything like that that could cause uh, issues. And I mean, I would say that's about it. And just anybody that's the, in terms of faculty, just having someone that's passionate about it, that, you know, that keeps a fire burning for them to want to do it. You know, like I, I'm on campus for, you know, I, if you were to put it on paper, I have, I'm scheduled 30 hours like a week, but I mean, I do so much more outside of the arena in my off time, like at home, you know, 
delving into more, um, you know, background knowledge on my opponents, um, trying to get more education for myself on how to be a better coach and so on and so forth. So just, I think the biggest thing is making sure that their team is very passionate about wanting to um, drive forward the program and esports in general and promotion. Thanks, Ryan. I know you guys also use Brightlink and if you can share a photo and maybe kind of walk me through, because like I said, I'm new. I, I remember 15 years ago, I was in uh, Seoul in Korea for a few weeks. Maybe that was the beginning of how the Korean government started pouring money into esports and sort of trying to propel some revenue behind the, the notion. Um, but of course the monitors then were really, really small. So when I kind of see how you guys are using projection technology, it's such a large space, you have whiteboard, you have interactivity. I'm just really curious, like how do you utilize the tools to, um, to coach, coach the team and what's your day to day is like? So we only have one of these projectors that we use in the room. Um, and it is primarily used to, um, well, at least for Overwatch, I, I'm pretty sure it still falls along the lines of other uh, sports as well, of the esports programs. Um, just like traditional sports, especially like football, is like probably the biggest one where you see all the X's and O's and, and lines and arrows. It's more or less the same thing. Um, so we do the same thing. We'll go over uh, footage. So like in the photo that I'm sharing, um, we're going over uh, one of our matches and I'm talking about like, you know, where we should be setting up and um, what we're running and what the opponent's running and just kind of using the link to obviously display that for all my students who are behind behind me in this photo or behind this photo, I should say. Um, they gather around and we kind of go over it step by step. Um, same thing with the markers. I can use the marker to just draw arrows. I mean, I use uh, black, which is a really dark color, so you can't see it. But I usually make arrows and markings about, you know, to just show like what we need to be doing um, at any given moment. So. Um, I only have two photos, but you kind of get the gist of it, especially yeah. because, you know, a traditional whiteboard, I would have to clean it and it would be kind of, uh, get dirty and then you can't, it doesn't look as uh, clean. So using even the, the markers that are associated with the, um, the bright link, it looks really good. So that way you can just get to clean, um, uh, Reese. Thanks. Um, Nick, um, how about you? Can you elaborate a little bit on your setup and maybe some of the technical potential challenges or opportunities um, for this sort of environment? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to sharing. So uh, there were some, some uh, uh, questions in the chat about the systems and, and we, we have four systems set up uh, for, for projectors and it's, uh, it goes to a, um, a, a computer in the back room that uh, projects it all up on the screen. Um, but we don't need to have four. We, we have four because the room is used for other purposes, other other classes. And I, I, I have an example of that, um, how it was used for a visual and performing arts class. So um, it, because it has four, we use them, but uh, you really don't need it. And uh, at the um, a similar size LCD display, which I, I have another room with LCDs in it, um, the LCDs are like 5,000 um, for, for a decent LCD monitor and um, that, uh, that is touch enabled because these, these are also um, all touch enabled. Um, so about $5,000 versus these were around 2,000. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's actually much cheaper to use the um, projectors and they, um, they're, they're brighter and um, with the new laser bulbs, they last every bit as long as the, as the LCD displays. Um, and, and like, uh, as, as Ryan was saying, we have, um, it's not a separate internet. It's just a, it, um, it's a separate channel that, that we operate on that, um, it, we're, we're allowed to operate on this separate channel that doesn't go through some of the, um, oversight of, uh, that the university has for other networks. So they, they actually call this the contractor network, which doesn't require all the boxes to be logged in because sometimes the, especially if you start using um, like a switch or a, you know, some of the other consoles, you're not able to log into the network. And so we're, we're on a separate network um, channel that doesn't require that kind of login. Um, and we have a, a network switch and a router that is separate um, but those are not super expensive. Um, 
so and it's a one gigabit switch and i think we paid 300 bucks for the switch on the router so it's it's not super expensive and and i am also on the school board for the local k-12 school so i understand about the costs uh, involved and and also the protection so one of the things and ryan mentioned this having a coach there um you know schools are sort of reticent uh, k-12 schools reticent to allowing an open network um and it's tough to get into some of these um the the network plays they're not they're not part of the um the school's network package so you have to provide a kind of a separate gateway out um, and so having a coach that's going to be there and monitoring what's going on, I think, is is really imperative. But you would have that for any other um, physical sport. You would always have a coach present, an adult in the room. And, and I think that's just as important for eSports um, for, for, for any number of reasons. So so that's uh, – that, um, and I'm going to jump to here. This is, this is how we use the room. Um, this is a visual and performing arts. That's a professor – and he's he's figuring out how we can use the camera to um, like the, take this mirrored effect, and uh, so he's actually a dance professor. So he, um, he's taking the mirror effect and showing how the mirror effect going you know kind of this uh, you know when you when you have a mirror and you're sticking it up to the camera and it kind of makes re um, recursive uh, images of of this the original. Um, he's he's showing you know he's kind of amazed at how that works and so we use this uh, this setup for um, probably about ten other classes in the evenings it's it's uh, devoted to esports so um, it's not just an esports program and this allows us to um, share courses with other other schools in the state um, which could be used um, our local high school we're getting ready to open a second high school and they're planning on using the same technology to share classes between the schools so they don't have to repeat or duplicate um, some of those niche classes so so I, I think the technology you know if you if you think creatively about it is is not um, not necessarily the barrier that it might seem um, initially um, in so both of you showed so I know Ryan uses a large screen and interactivity for coaching um in your case is there a value in you know students having their monitor but also having a display where they're showing what they are playing or what they're doing and just kind of trying to get into or others watching them actually play yeah. and, and provide yeah that's the idea so that um so every, people don't have to stand over their shoulders watching what they're doing you can sit back as a coach or other players and watch the whole game unfold um, on the screen of, uh, um, in front of you. And I think if, as you're trying to have tournaments or those you know big big events in person, when we get back to those, um, having this kind of setup is going to be really um, a adds a lot of value to the players. Um, you know, yeah, I I, th I think that's really important. Um, cool. How much how much do schools spend on stadiums? Right. You know, for a football stadium and you know we have just a, almost as many people probably as many people playing esports um competitively and going on to professional careers involved in esports as probably more so than um, many of the physical sports particularly at high school level it's a good point so piggybacking on on that last question and Nick, we'll start with you and move to ryan it sounds like you guys both feel like there's enough passion and interest any high school can on a budget transition a traditional classroom into a space for esports um any particular tips on some ideas that are more um specific for someone who may be attending today to go yeah oh okay i have this particular space and i can turn this lab into a an esports and get started I, i'm a big fan of the dual use um, perspective, um, showing showing people how this space um, can be set up to be a really cutting edge classroom that can be used for multiple things um, aside from just esports, uh, and and then it, if you do it well, it can be um, a real transformative space for esports as well. So um, I, I think that's that's really how I would get started in the in the schools is. 
um, if you say hey, we need you know eighty or th- you know eighty thousand dollars to set up an esports arena, it's it's probably going to be too much. But um, with just a you know a, a couple of um, of mon- a couple of uh, projectors and a couple of computers, you could you could really get things going. It's, it, it depends on which games you're going to play. Um, you, anywhere from from three to eight computers you'd need, um, but um, you know. That's that's really all you have to have to get going. I'm okay with you saying monitors instead of projectors. I'm I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay, Ryan. Uh, what about you? I mean, I know you know there may have been a time where everyone's setup wasn't this sophisticated, and so you know organically you may have had to make do. Do you have any particular tips or ideas that you can share with people who may be attending? And are like, oh yeah, I have this room, and I can perhaps make it a multi-purpose room. Uh, yeah. So just kind of following up on what Nick says, same thing. You can turn any classroom and just make yeah. it into a multi-use thing into um, into a separate um thing, and like say like after school, just like in traditional sports, especially in um <clears throat> in elementary and middle school. Um, I guess high school too. So, um, same thing. Just having just a few computers, depending on whatever you're getting into and just making it work with just the bare minimum is just enough um, to get it going. You don't necessarily need to have something super high end, like that's all just just for looks um, in terms of just like, as long as the game can function and you can play on it effectively, then you know you can, you can make it happen. Um, I have uh, two players um, <clears throat> that were playing, <laughs> I'm sure as a Jonathan knows the terminology, there's a lot of kids that maybe had played it with potatoes basically uh, for PCs. So they're very, very bare bones, minimum, like, mm-hmm. you know, Dell, uh, Dell computer, um, basic, and they still made it work. So when they came into the, uh, into the room, um, they actually, uh, were quite amazed. They're like, oh my gosh, like I've never seen the game like this before. You know, it's the same game, but they haven't seen it as polished, but I mean, they still played exactly the same, whether they were in the room or at home, it still functioned necessarily the same, um especially during the COVID year um, when everybody was at home, we still um, were participating in tournaments and it was the same thing. We would have sometimes have internet issues at home um, or maybe their computer would like, kind of freeze up a little bit, but you know, as long as we had, when we were in the room, it still became um, kind of an equalized uh, standard for everybody. Um, but just enough, as long, as long as you have enough to run what you need, uh, you can make it work. And same thing goes for the space. So as long as you have, a person dedicated a room that you can use, whether that's a you know already being used as a classroom, as long as you can make you know the PC set up and get the game running, it should just be enough. Um, so Jonathan, you were talking about sort of the physical impact on gamers and those who choose this as a career. How do you feel when you have a personal perspective? This is really random on all this virtual reality stuff that's happening, that's gonna even confine you more. Um, and then on the flip side of it, um, we, you know, we also have partners that actually try to use projection and camera technology for more physical gaming, where your body or your interaction with the game can get you off your seat. Um, love to kind of see if what you guys talk about when you get together as to that, how that may change the, the future of esports. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid and Microsoft came out with the Kinect and we thought that was the coolest camera projection thing ever. And now we have these Epsons in the in the room downstairs. And when we first, I was one of the people that helped install it and seeing like all the reactions, even the, you know, faculty and staff that never play video games thought it was really cool just messing with it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's really impressive. I think if, if you're, you know, like like Ryan said, you don't need to have like the highest computer or the best internet in the world, but you do need some, you know, basic like structures. And I think having a projector that helps you see everyone's screen and you can write on it, it really, really helps. Like it was the before and after was crazy. Is, is there an element of like socializing with your comrades physically as opposed to in a metaverse where you're all just in your headsets right like i think that still has value right in 
from your perspective? Yeah, during during the like COVID, um, we weren't allowed on campus. So like Ryan said, all of our practices and tournaments and games were always from home. Mm-hmm. And it's not really the same as it is if you're sitting right next to your friend and you know you have all that energy inside the room you're more excited together um, instead of just being alone um, it's it's necessary I feel like if you're alone for too long then it's like you're gonna burn out and you're gonna hate it so for sure um, Ryan I know you talked about an event that you guys held um, and I don't know if you have a photo of it but can you talk about that particular event and what was the purpose of it and even if you have a photo, better yet, you can share it with us who are not in the field. Um, unfortunately, I don't have them. They're on a separate. They're on a separate Google Drive that I don't have access to at the moment. Um, but <clears throat> so a big thing that's um, that's really you know kind of a big deal in esports is called uh, LAN events. So L A N. So it's just basically they're. Um, groups of basically getting everybody together and hosting tournaments that you can host in person and it's a live event um that was ultimately one of the bigger goals that i wanted to achieve um with the school is to have them <clears throat> still be like a traditional sports you know you go into the stadium buy your ticket go watch the game and it'd be the same concept um we just recently hosted a, a land event in uh, in river park which is a um a kind of like a, a shopping center um in Fresno, um, we had a stage. We had a stage set up um, with the projector, and we had six computers on each side. And we hosted. We played against a couple other schools local to the area. So we played against Sacramento State, um, Dominion Hills, and I can't remember the last school, but they're all local in California. And they um, we offered them to come down to Fresno and just kind of have an event. And people like you know, and it's it's in a live setting, so we tried the ultimate goal was to reach out to, to um, the community to get them interested in what we're, we are doing. Um, So having people, even like I said, especially like young kids, you know, that are in elementary school that know what rocket league is, or, you know, or seen overwatch uh, heroes, they kind of stop and want to sit down and doing so they can meet with other coaches and other, um, the programmies that were attending to ask questions and get it started because um, one of the bigger things that we're trying to do as a university is to um, to reach out to the community in, in Fresno and, and frankly California in general to not only get new recruits for players and uh, more staff, but just getting people again to continue to be on board with it. Um, uh, my other job that I have, I'm a, a server as well during the day, and when I tell people about my my night job, they're always confused about what esports is, and so I go and describe it to them. And then, you know, they tell me about, like, you know, their grandkids or their kids are interested in video games and think that, you know, it, it was kind of a waste of time. You know, that's what we grew up listening to as, you know, like in the 90s. But now when I tell people, you know, the there was a child that was 13 that won a million dollar Fortnite tournament in 2000 and what, 15, I think, like 2015, 16, uh, named Benji. And he won a million dollar tournament. He was only 13 years old. And wow. since that moment, esports has escalated like so much higher. You know, tournaments are mil- in the millions of dollars for prize money, and you know these kids, you know, that are starting that young, you know, it's it's encouraging for them because then they can go to university and apply those skills and get scholarships or grants or anything that's, and apply it to even go necessarily into the pros as well. You know, all those things, um, you know, is just to show that it's not just, you know, a waste of time, essentially. So that was more or less what our goal was with the land, as well as, you know, having, um, you know, the players interact with, uh, let's say, with the, the people as well in person, you know, and asking them questions and just kind of getting kind of like the celebrity treatment, essentially, and just kind of showing up just like how you would with the basketball team or the football team here at State. So um, that was kind of the biggest thing. That was a really, really nice event. Um, and I'm hoping to do it hopefully every year, um, you know, pending. But that's kind of what we held here this last fall. Um, there was a question about grant, and you mentioned that. And also, uh, there was a question about if um, at Fresno State that there's an NIL agreements for independent sponsorships. And I think both you and Nick can probably talk about that a little bit in terms of opportunities. And um, it seems like there are grants available. Is that right? 
Um, currently for Fresno State, we are still working on getting sponsorships uh, ourselves. Um, so um, I was going to answer one of the questions earlier. So a lot of our equipment we got through a discount because Fresno State is part of the uh, Dell family and associated with that is Alienware. Alienware is their high performance um, is our high performance line, which is usually associated with gamers. So we got a small discount on our setups, uh, originally the pre-built computers. Um, so there was a small discount applied. Um, in terms of other like scholarship funds, uh, we did hold host a GoFundMe uh, program last last fall uh, to promote esports and trying to get people to um, to obviously like donate to it. We're still currently trying to seek out more local sponsorships uh, in the area. Uh, to have more again more live events like in the river park area um uh we reached out to uh me and Ed's, which is a local pizza and uh pizzeria and we discussed about trying to have them host uh the event or at least um support it um but that is something that we're currently working on again we still have uh more or less a smaller staffing um in terms yeah. of higher reps so um like i said like i'm i am coaching obviously the head coach but then i still try to reach out and do those things myself as well to try to get more people involved and I believe that the land was one of the bigger, bigger things to get people in the area to want to reach out and support and help. Um, but currently we do not offer that, but that is something we are definitely working on in going into our third year as a program. Thank you. And Nick, is there anything you'd like to add or what you guys are doing differently? Yeah, so um, we, we, one of the things that we're trying to get set up and we had it lined up before COVID hit was um, in Virginia, all of the competitive high school programs are managed by an organization called the Virginia High School League. I, 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 I'm not aware of that, you know, if there's an equivalent at other in other um, states, but in Virginia, everything is, is coordinated by VHSL. Uh, and so they reached out to us and asked us if we would host a high school tournament, and, and we were trying to get that done. And so it'd be like, um, like Ryan said, a, a, a land tournament where people show up and compete, um, but it would be more of an organized t tournament where, um, you know, just like with a, a basketball, you know, state basketball championship or something like that, they would come in and, and, um, and participate. And so we have, um, we have several rooms that have network access set up for eSports. And they're they're not all active at the same time. Only uh, only two at a time are active, but we could set that up and then and then host those um, tournaments here. And I think that uh, um, w when you start to build those tournaments and have that kind of um, attention given to esports, I, I think it's you start to get more support. Um, you know, uh, schools never seem to have a problem. Um, outfitting the football stadium or the basketball stadium. Um, somehow there's always money available for that. And so um, I think if you get the, if you get esports on the same footing as um, football and basketball by the recognition, uh, I, I think the same will be true. You guys are the pathfinders, that's for sure. Um, Jonathan, you are now a senior, right? And um, can you tell me what your plans are now and you know how esports may have helped you? Uh, <clears throat> so I graduate in May, so hopefully I land a job. Uh, um, other than that, um, I might come back to for post bachelor's and hopefully get my master's. Um, esports really helped me a lot because at the beginning I, you know, I was never really on a team, so I don't know a good team. I never really had team practice in a team setting. So, you know, this really helped me, like, you know, with people that get upset with each other, you know, how to deal with that, you know, how to deal with, you know, drama and conflicts and stuff. It really just, like, when I, now in the future, going forward, working in a team is not a problem for me. I, I look forward to that rather than individually. Some of us are still learning how to deal with drama. <laughs> but uh, so if you had any advice for administrators and teachers from high school or college, from your perspective as someone who's passionate about the industry and you want to build a career in it, um, what would it be? Um, hmm. I think the most important thing that the, the school can do for the students is to let them know that they're heard because I remember 
two a year before the Fresno State program was launched, me and the president of the club were talking to every dean of the school, trying to just let them hear us, and every dean just kind of shut the door on us, and it was really demoralizing. And when you get something like that, and the school kind of ignores you, it, it can really damper the mood. So just letting the no students like you actually sit down and listen to them, and you know be okay to tell them that going like just listen I guess is would be my big big thing thank you um so maybe both you know, Ryan and Nick uh in looking at broader picture of the impact of esports and you guys are clearly both very passionate about the topic particular examples that you know have, have had positive impacts on students um that that you have had and um also other maybe social emotional elements that how a sport like this can help students that you want to sort of um, surface for us today. So um, as, as we started launching our esports program, uh, several other institutions reached out and, and, um, and other industries. Uh, so I, IBM, uh, there's, a, there's a head of esports at IBM. And I, you know, he reached out to me, and and uh, we we talked, and East, and they're using esports as a way of identifying and developing leaders within IBM, um, and the same is true from all of the um, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Um, they all have esports programs, and the academies are starting to do the same thing. And so I think um, people are pe people are seeing that, you know, okay, so if you're if you're six foot five and two hundred and fifty pounds, you can play football. But I'm guessing, just looking at Jonathan, he's not six foot five and 250 pounds. Um, and so, what? So if 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 physical athletics is the only way to develop leaders on a on a high school currently, then then guys like Jonathan are left out because he's he's not going to get to be six five two fifty while he's you know while he's in college if he's a senior. So um, maybe growth hormones. I don't know what you got going on, Jonathan, but. But um, but I you know the, so there I, I think it is an issue of of equity and inclusion um, as well that that um, you know there are people that uh, that can't walk that are really engaged in athletics but can't play and so esports gives them an opportunity so there's there's just a whole um, realm of opportunities for our students to participate and it's a booming industry um, and and. And, and the industry surrounds more than just the players. So I, I think that's, uh, that's something that everybody, everyone should keep in mind as they're, um, as they're contemplating this and, and really evaluate uh, just how, how, do we, how do we allow more students to get that kind of leadership experience and the teamwork that um, Jonathan spoke about. Um, so the last, I mean, I have a couple more questions. And I'd like to leave some time for the Q and A's. Um, if I was going to ask you guys to give me top two, three things that um, high school, middle schools have that should consider to start an e-school program. And I think your number one would be just do it. So maybe <clears throat> you can give me um, one or two things that can get them started, and then anything else that you may want to add that I may have missed to ask. Um, you know, touching on pretty much the things I was saying before, um, <clears throat> find, find your, you know, your fellow student basis, talk about, you know, who else is interested, you know, especially like, you know, Jonathan's case, you know, he had friends that were into league that, you know, are already on campus, find even more people, you know, you never know who else could be interested that you never would have expected and see if they're driven to want to, to get better and start a club. Starting a club, I think, and just getting people that are more going to want to be more serious about competitiveness rather than just being casual um, is a good way to get people to uh, to come in and support it. And then, you know, just finding someone else, like I said, like a faculty support, I think would be gigantic. You know, like Justin said, everyone's coming through and shutting the door on you when no one wants to help out. Like, it's not exactly, you know, exciting, but... You know, if you find the one person that really wants to like support and help you out, you know, they're going to take those extra steps and the administrative part to, you know, get something going beyond just club and like hopefully get more varsity or get, you know, resources and put it into it. So that way it can be used, uh, 
for you know future generations even after those uh, initial groups leave and have someone uh, some more people recruited and start the whole process over and so on and so forth um, those would probably be my biggest takeaways uh, for k through 12. nick jonathan anything you want to add I think um, another really important aspect for to starting this is you need to have the ability to get rid of the economic barrier between all the students. So that this really just goes back to you have to have a room and you have to have the equipment that's equal footing. Um, you don't want someone who, you know, has potential but doesn't have the internet or the the you know supercomputer like the other people do. So. If you don't have the ability to get rid of that entry barrier, I think it it's not really doing the program justice. So. Anything that manufacturers like Epson can do to support that you'd like to see? Um, maybe just more sponsorships with schools. You know, just mm -hmm. more, more grants, more programs, stuff like that. That would that would help every school for sure. Okay. And I, I don't think it has to be like a, I, I don't think anybody expects Epson to fully fund uh, um, any you know high schools program, but um, getting a little bit of money um, or sponsorship or equipment um, is sort of justification or validation that the program has value outside of um, the little circle of of folks that are playing. Um, if Epson says, "Hey, this is important enough that we're going to sponsor a team with a projector or a um, something, then I, I think that really can go a long way. Thank you. Um, anything else you would like to add before I turn it over to Kevin to kind of block and tackle some of the questions? Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, very educating for me. I already see a lot of light bulb moments in my head about what we can do in the future together. Um, but I want to turn it to Kevin if there's nothing else to add. No, well, uh, Remy, thanks so much. Uh, what a great conversation. And w another one of the great things about having tech savvy gamers, I think, on, on a webinar uh, is that all the questions as they came in were answered during the course of the conversation. Um, although, Nick, there were a couple that came in that and they're still coming in right now talking about uh, FERPA and uh, SIPA compliance. And I think this might be almost your school board hat uh, as much as it is your, your, your higher ed app. Uh, hat. Can you talk a little bit about setting up those separate networks? And actually, even if there aren't se separate networks, how do you have uh, high schools set up uh, in terms of those compliance issues? So um, somebody mentioned SIPA, and I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Is that a is that a California? I don't know. I don't know what SIPA is. Yeah, the uh, fe federal uh, regulations about. Uh, no, FERPA, how... I know FERPA, but oh, this gotcha. is. It, it says in the question Troy Moore asked, um, it, it, it specified SIPA, and I just, C-I-P-A, I, I, I wasn't familiar with that. So it must be California. Um, so, you know, every state has the regulations, and uh, of course there are um, uh, federal regulations, FERPA. But FERPA does, is, is really about privacy of students, and so um, you can you can handle FERPA with a letter from the parents um, allowing them to participate. So, um, oh, Children's Internet Protection Act. Yeah, so um, all that stuff can be handled with permission, with parental permission. It's not a, a huge obstacle to overcome. And if, and if there's an adult in the room that is watching what's happening and, and, um, and, and sort of protecting what's going on, um, you do have to kind of keep an eye on Twitch and, um, and, and some of, you know, uh, Discord. Uh, things can get out of hand, but you can set all those up to have um, relatively private conversations. Um, and, and, and again, with uh, parental consent, I think it, none of them are insurmountable. Great. Great. I think that answers that, that question. And with that, I usually have a kind of a, a, a last uh, horizon question. There, there's so much promise here and so much advancement, even during the pandemic, it seems that esports is accelerated really to be in the top but uh jonathan and ryan i mean where do you see yourselves as gamers in five years once you're once you're out of school i mean is this something that you'll pursue i mean beyond just the professional opportunities is this something that you think will be a, a lifelong passion for you yeah um i went down to 
the studio where the pros play. And I've had an interview as a, I'm a math major. And one of the opportunities with math there is like, you know, just game analysts, you know, for a special team, like they'll just, that's a career. People have been doing it since 2010. So there's very, there's a lot of job opportunities depending on what you want to go in for. I have a lot of friends that didn't even go to college that have been in the scene for eight years, you know, it's if it's something you're passionate about i feel like just just go in there's always a job like nick showed that um that web of all the different job opportunities it's it's massive yeah and uh and ryan with yourself uh so same thing it's like kind of piggybacking off of the mixed uh, web thing i had a similar um presentation that i made by hand with the same thing when i was presenting it to uh my administration too to show all the opportunities that are outside of just the room itself um in terms of like you know journalism um social media and broadcasting are kind of the bigger ones that we can um do now <clears throat> even as you say you're like um talking about gaming in five years it's kind of funny because um i would say jonathan seems to be in the same realm as me i i was playing since i was three so i've been kind of gave me for 25 years and probably plan to go another 25 years. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always been a part of my life. So including this, um, I said, I have uh, only one year of city college and that was about it for me. I'd just been working my entire life. So, but gaming never really went away from me. And so being passionate enough to just want to be a part of it, like I said, when the head coach position was taken at Fresno State, I still told him like, I need to be a part of this somehow some way whatever you need you know assistant you know somebody to grab you coffee I don't really care I just I knew I needed to be a part of this at the end of the day because I knew that this is what you know blends a career opportunity as well as like my passion for gaming and I knew I wanted to do this um so just being driven even as of right now we still have there's plenty of spots open and if you approached me and told me what you can do I'd do the same thing the same thing that Josh did for me, I would do for this next person that can approach me and tell them, you know, what we need and what we can do. Even if you have no educational background, like I'm willing to show you like what it takes. And if you, and if you want to uh, go for that and put yourself into that position, then yeah, we'll make it work. Um, so just be passionate about it, you know, and, you know, opportunities can open up, you know, beyond Fresno State, you know. And uh, Nick, when you, you talk about the comparisons with football and basketball and, and building the stadiums, I'll put you in the hot seat. Uh, what sort of time frame, uh, in the best case scenario, do you see esports uh, being uh, parallel to those to those mammoth programs? Oh wow! Um, so I, I've been a part of the um, first robotics program for ten or fifteen years. And, and that's it, it's it's a very similar path I'd say to esports is that um, we we can't um, as a, we can't celebrate um, only physical sports um, we and then expect everybody to just you know automatically go into some uh, technology or science job when they when they get to um, college um, and graduate so we have to provide examples um, if you know if you're an engineer. Uh, your your children don't see you engineering at home typically, right? So um, if you're a sports dad, you go out and throw the ball with your kids and all that's great. But, um, it, you know, we have to have these kind of venues for us to show our, our children and whether they're our children or just the children in the community that there are opportunities in STEM. And here's here's some of the exciting ways that you can get involved if you're um, if you're interested. I think we have to do that if we're going to expect students to in, engage um, and and stay on that path going through high school, you know, middle school and the high school. Middle school and high school, they start to make decisions. If there's if there's no um, STEM, I'm, I'm assuming everybody knows STEM, but if there's no STEM related activity in your school that that causes people to be inspired, and the only place you get inspiration is in football, basketball, or some other sport, then kids tend to track away from the STEM fields and into those sports fields. And, you know, I, I can take the easy math class and and do well and, and then play football, or, you know, I can take the hard classes. And so people start to make those decisions. And so having those um, exemplars of, um, of STEM fields, I think is critical if we're going to make progress. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I see that our time is just about up. So I'm going to wrap things up here. 
If you submitted a question that we didn't get to in the Q&A portion, someone from Epson will follow up with you shortly. I'd like to thank all of our presenters today for a really informative presentation. And I'd like to thank all the audience members for joining us as well. That was a really great back channel, uh, a lot of fun. As a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording along with the slides. Thanks again for participating and have a great day. Thanks guys. Thank you everyone.